Welcome to the highlights package of chapter two. Marketing strategy is one of the areas that we have a full-fledged course, a 13-week course here. And as such, this chapter is the highlights package of a highlights package. It's really skimming the surface of the depth that is available if you want to go on and study marketing strategy. And strategic marketing is one of these areas that has been very heavily researched both academically and from the practitioner's perspective, there are a lot of books on strategy. There's a lot of research on strategy. So we're going to give you some of the big tickets, key points, the highlight points. But please understand there's a lot more depth to this area and a lot more detail that you can go into should you choose. So at this point, we're still thinking marketing from the perspective of the firm. It's really important to understand that a lot of the early parts of the operation of marketing are about understanding the organization. What is it that the organization can do, wants to do, and then we move forward towards, well, what is the consumer looking for and how well do we match up our skills, abilities, and capacity with the desires and needs of the market. So we're still focused on what can we do? And that starts to translate over into how can we understand the market? What knowledge, what skills, what abilities do we have within the organization to understand our consumer? And from there, we move into what can we create to meet those needs? But first, the organization needs to know itself. So to get to that point, we have a sequence of planning. At the top level, we've got the business plan. And the business plan's role is to set the direction for the whole of the organization, for the whole of the firm. It's vitally important to understand that within the umbrella of a business plan, you can have multiple marketing plans. So the marketing plan has a role to play as a subunit of the business plan and the business planning process. We can also draw on information we learn during business planning and the planning process, and we can build the marketing plan to fit a business plan or business goal. But quite frequently, you'll have one business plan and multiple marketing plans. So what we have is three levels of planning process. We've got the operational plan, the functional plan, and the strategic plan. And to do this, we have the strategic planning process, which is the top level. At the strategic plan, what you're looking at doing is setting the broad picture. Where are we going? What are we going to do? How are we going to get there? Aspects such as the growth strategies are big decisions. Do we want to create a new product, which is going to be a big investment? Do we want to create a new market, which is going to be an even bigger investment? Do we want to sell more to the people we already have? Reward loyalty. Do we want to go to a market we haven't encountered before? Or do we want to go and roll the dice and create something new for someone new and take our chances there? These are the big items. These are the top level strategy. To do this, we need to understand why we have the organization, what the organization wants to achieve, where the organization is operating, factors such as the internal environment, who we are as a unit, and then look at what we want to do from the business portfolio point of view. What is this product's goal? What is this product's current status? Particularly if the product currently exists. We then have the tier below it, which is the functional plan. And this is where we're looking at from the point of view of, we have a direction, we know we want to go from point A to point D. Here we're mapping the journey from A to B, from B to C, from C to D. We are looking at this from the point of view of what needs to happen to take, for each step to take place. To perform a situation analysis, we are looking at it from the point of view of, from the business plan, from what we learned there, from the strategic plan, 
and look at the strategic plan again, internal and external environments feed into the situation analysis. We look around, we now know what we can look at, but we can now judge the internal and the external in terms of where are we strong, what are our opportunities that our strength gives us, what are our weaknesses, and what threats or problems do those weaknesses create. Having looked at our circumstances, we can then say, well, what do we want to do from a marketer's perspective? What are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve? Objectives translate into strategy. Objectives tell us what we want to achieve. Strategy says, how do we want to try to achieve it? Implementation says, what are the precise steps? When are we going to achieve it? What are the tasks that need to be undertaken? And that creates another level of planning. The monitor and control is to look at it critically and say, are we on track? Are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule? It is as vital to know if you're doing better than expected as it is to know if you're doing worse than expected. So once we've said we will have the direction, the objective, and the strategies, we then have the implementation. And this is operational planning where we go from statements of 5% growth to on Thursday at 3 p.m. there will be an advert run on the following radio stations, the outcome of which should be a spike of traffic to our website at 3.05 to 3.15. There should be a 1% to 2% uptick in the shopping cart at 3.10, 3.15, and 3.20. So we're looking at that level specific. We're looking at times and places. Now, because this is an introductory subject and this is an overview, we're not going to ask you to create a plan. You won't be tasked with the development of an operational plan or a business plan or a marketing plan. Those are complicated tasks that need you to have some experience with the whole of marketing and some detail. At this point in your skill sets, it's enough to know they exist and what the components are, but we're not going to ask you to write one. So let's talk about some component parts now. The mission statement is one of these elements of marketing that unfortunately have become a bit of a cliche in the general public. Fortunately, still have a very technical language and meaning in marketing. The mission statement asks the question of what business are we in? And the answer to that is, what do we as a firm want to do? Who's our, when we say what business are we in, we're also saying who are the customers we want? What are the products we want to make? Are we the ones who go first? Are we the ones who hang back and watch? Your second question you should be able to ask and answer in the mission statement is, who do we want to address? Who's the customer? And lastly, the mission statement will start guiding you in directions of, in order to be this business and serve these customers, what do we need to do to improve the capacity and capability of the company? So the mission statement sets the general direction. The marketing plan with its situation analysis is a combination of the internal and external environment reviews, an understanding of who your competition is and what they offer, and what customers currently get from that competition, who the customers are, and we start going into a lot more depth and detail when we start talking about market segments shortly. Plus, you're also building on information that was captured in the strategic plan, and that information feeds into the analysis of the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threat, and the environment analysis of politics, environment, so, socioeconomic and technology. It's also important to understand that SWOT and PEST are reports. You undertake an internal and an external analysis to generate the information that you then summarize as a SWOT. You don't start going, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, independently of looking at the internal and external environments. So starting with the internal environments, we're looking at this from the point of view of documenting what is. So 
People is who do we currently have? Culture, what's the organization like? Is it innovative? Is it conservative? Facilities, what do we have in terms of production capacity and capability? Technologies, particularly this is actually an interesting one at the moment for what tech do we have, what do we need, and what are we developing? But also in the internal environment, you start looking at this from a point of view of, well, given our mission statement, do we have the right people? Do we need to get more people? Do we need to get different types of people? Can we upskill the people we currently have? Is our organizational culture consistent with what our mission statement is? If we say that our mission statement has the words innovation, but our organizational culture is risk averse, then we have a mismatch that becomes a weakness. On the analysis, we say, well, our mission is one thing, our culture is another. That is a problem. That becomes then a problem. Do we resolve the, uh, through the mission statement changing or the culture changing? The external environments, again, we see the pest analysis making its uh, opportune return. We're looking for the factors that could impact an organization. Now, the political, economic, socio-cultural, and technological environments are huge. You can spend a lifetime working in this. In fact, if you want to become a futurist, this is a really great area to uh, get some skills and make a bit of money on the side. In politics, what we're looking for is what impact will the government's attitude. So the government comes out swinging, saying that the economy is a disaster, everything's ruined, it's all terrible, everything's bad. That's going to hurt consumer confidence. Consumer confidence goes down, discretionary spending goes down. You don't want to be in the luxury goods market. The government comes out saying everything's brilliant, isn't thing, isn't the world just great? You probably want to be in the small luxuries field because people will be feeling confident. Similarly, at socio-cultural trends, you're looking for what are the opportunities that are present if we're changing the way that people live. So for a long period in marketing, we saw the empty nest, we saw the two people, one house, single house occupancy. We're now seeing a rise in the return to the multiple share house for longer. We're seeing more rental properties. That means that we've got different types of market demand. If we don't own a house, we don't want to necessarily commit to heavy objects that we're going to customize the house with. So objects that are either rented or short-term, disposable, or perhaps the uh, bookshelf with hinges that you can just pack down back into its single package exit uh, strand strategy. So we're looking again, what is the impact? What does it do? And that's where it matters is the pest analysis is just that, it's an analysis. It then lends itself to being written up as a report. And the report of the SWOT analysis, what are our strengths? And that is basically, what do we do well which is our internal. Our opportunities are our pest analysis. What is out there in the market that our strengths will suit? Similarly, weaknesses can also be driven by strengths. What do we do well that the market doesn't care about? That's a weakness. We might be the best manufacturer of a redundant technology. You make the best 3G phone on the market, great. Everyone's producing 4G networks. You have a weakness. You have a strength that doesn't have a market to match. Threats are similarly. It's where we've got weakness or you've got a market that you don't have a strength. Again, here, it's the analysis. It's the, what does this mean for our firm and what do we then do with this information? So what analysis isn't the end point, it's the starting point. So, objectives. Objectives should be driven by the mission statement, the business plan, and the objectives give you a reason to have this plan. You need good objectives. So, the first thing is the smart objective is your mantra. From here on in, when you think objectives, they need to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and there's got to be a factor of time. Uh, that's timetabling, whether it's timely, what it is, time is critical. Specific means that you can 
tell whether you have achieved it or not. Measurable is the means by which you turn specific into can I count it? Can I tick a box? Can I know that this has happened? Attainable is does this match against our strengths? Would it be thwarted by our weaknesses? Realistic is can it be done? Now, if you come into the market to say I am going to create a product that will knock Apple off the share market and destroy Microsoft on the way through, well, it's not very specific. Your measurement is, does Apple still exist? Your attainable is, I don't think so. And your realistic is, look, sit down, we need to talk. But what you want to do instead is you want to say, okay, I have a plan, specific by and this is where you can start bringing in the timeliness. You can say your objective, by the end of the calendar year, we will have developed a new product for sale in the 18 to 21 year old market, males, north end of Canberra, as our pilot market for a fashion, high fashion product. We have the designers, we have the capacity to make the product. We have a timetable, a market, it's specific, we'll know. If we get to the end of the year and we haven't got this product and we haven't sold it in these markets, we know we haven't achieved it. So SMART's really got to have some focus to it. Your objectives have got to be able to be converted to metrics. Now in terms of a couple other aspects here for critical uh, terminology and ideas, the business unit, these are areas that, again, I want you to have a look at this in the text. Uh, because you're about to come across one of the most classic models of marketing. The BCG growth matrix strategy is a remarkable thing for the fact that somebody sat down and said, stars, cows, dogs, question marks. You're all right. That describes our marketing strategies. This is a very basic model, but it's also a very robust model for the fact that it is quite simple. There are more complicated growth strategies. There are a whole series of these that you will deal with in the marketing strategy course. But for us, the question is, how much market share do we have for an existing product? How much market share are we likely to get if it's a new product? Is the market growing? And where do we sit? If we own a high share of a high growth market, then that's good business opportunity. If we've got a, a high share of a low market, it's just going to tick over nicely. It'll keep funding things. The cash cows, they're worth having. And never underestimate the value of the cash cow. But if we've got a high share of a market that nobody wants. Or we've got a low share of a market that's not growing. Why are we there? What are we doing? The dogs. Why do we want to keep this product? Now there might be strategic reasons to do that. And this is why marketing strategy is a complicated area, is that there are oftentimes good business reasons to leave a dog type product, a low, it's low market share, we've got a low share of it, it's a low growth rate, but it's a defensive position. It's blocking somebody else entering a market. So long as we've got that, they won't come in and get their foothold, which we saw, we'll see this in the marketing strategy area. Quite often that things that to your organization might be a low, low share, low growth, you don't think much of it, can be a start for someone else's organization, just simply on scale. A market that Microsoft looks at and goes, no, nah, it's not worth it. The Apple looks at and goes, I don't think so. It's just not worth our time. Could be a huge market opportunity for your BlackBerry or your Nokia because the scaling is different. So again, what you're looking at here is this is the sort of model that it's a good way to start thinking. It's a way of framing your thinking. It's not a definitive piece. It's not the be all and end all. It's just a starting point to say, of these units, where they where do they stand? Do we have a good slice of the market? Are we looking at 
uh, a market that's growing? Is it a market we want to be in? Is it a market we want to be out of? Now, this model is your friend. It's called the Ansoff matrix. It is one of the best ways of seeing the world. It's one of the best thinking approaches for dealing with marketing strategy. And it asks two questions. Question number one is, do we have a customer? And question number two is, do we have a product? Question number one, do we have a customer? Yes, no. Yes, it's an existing market. Do we have a product for that existing market? And if we do, then we want to sell more products to grow. We need to sell more products to the people who currently buy a product, market penetration. Existing market, but we don't have a product, or rather, we have an existing market and they've got an unmet need. Well, this is an opportunity for a new product, product development. We've got an existing product. We've sold it to everyone who's going to buy it in our current market. It's time to go find a new market. Let's go recruit. Market development. And then there's the difficult one. Well, we don't have a product. And we don't have a market. Or rather, we've got a new product. And that product lacks a market. We've never sold this product before. We don't have a market we're addressing it to. But we've built it and it looks kind of neat. Diversification. You're going to go find someone who wants what you're offering. In order of safety, in order of ease, market penetration, because you already have the customer, you're just selling more units to them. You're finding different ways to get them to consume it. Followed by market development. You already have customers. You already have products. You already know how to sell this product to a group of people. You're expanding. Product development. You already have the customers, so you know them. So you have a chance to go and build on your existing reputation and sell them something new. The hardest, the most difficult, and the one also known as the startup is diversification. You've got something new and you haven't sold it to anyone before, so you've got to convince them that they want it, or you've got to convince them that they're the market in the first place. Diversification has some of the moderate payoffs, the best payoffs frankly, are out of market development and product development, so long as you already have either a product or a market. If you don't have either, you're stuck with diversification. The Ansoff matrix will be used repeatedly across marketing, both in this course and in other courses. So get used to it, get familiar with it, learn market penetration, product development, market development, diversification, Learn the combinations, learn the two by two matrix. It's a very, very useful approach to seeing the world. All right, let's talk externally. Now let's talk about what are the factors that we're going to be dealing with. Now, one of the things I want to draw to your attention now is that in chapter one, we mentioned the concept of the market segment and we mentioned the concept of segmentation. The environments provide means by which you can gain information to build market segments. So the type of thinking you do over the next couple of slides, the way you see the world, this information gets to be reused. And so one of the great things about marketing and marketing planning is that you keep your notes, you hang on to your notes, so you can go back and reuse them and build on them. So let's talk the internal environment first. These are the aspects that you can control in your organization. Those of you doing management majors, those of you who have done HR, these are, the word control is a little flexible, but this is a facet where you can actually set the norms of your organization. The idea of risk taking, the reward structures, if you are rewarded for taking risk, but not punished for taking for failure, then you're going to have a high risk it may be more innovative, but also is more likely to be a gambler's paradise. Whereas if you get penalized for risk, whether the risk was successful or failed, you're more likely to have a conservative defensive mindset. 
The internal environment is really important because it will also influence how you interact with the customer, it will influence your branding, and the credibility of how you present yourself. Now, if you are known for having been established in 1847, you've got a crest that involves a lot of silver, a bit of Latin, and a peerage. It's going to be hard for you to come forward and say, we're a tech company, innovative, cutting edge. Unless you've always been a tech company. If you were the ones who were first there, the company history goes back as far as, hey, we looked at this thing and said, you know what, replace the horse. That sort of brand, reputation, corporate culture, those aspects of the internal environment impact on the decisions you get to make as a marketer. So you need to understand it. You also need to know that you can change it. The economic environment, this is an important facet to look at in terms of what is happening with the money in the community. How is the economy looking? What are the unemployment rates or employment rates looking like? What's the market demand? How much money is floating around? Now, one of the things about being a marketer is that all economic environment information is good and bad. It all has an influence. The positive influences, if you are in an environment where there's a lot of money and there's cash flowing freely, you are going to be up against a lot of competition. So it's got a good side, there's money. Bad side, there's a lot of competitors. If the market is very tight, the money is not flying, a lot of the competitors will have dropped out, so it's a market opportunity. There'll be an established main player. If you can do better than who the major player in the market is, there's your opportunity. Money's tight, be more valuable, be of better value than the current offer. All of it is something that you can use to make a decision. And this is the key to these environments scans is that you're looking for the capacity to make decisions. Competitive environment, this is one of the areas that we are going to teach you how to deal with competitive intelligence over the course of this semester. The reason why I am asking you to undertake tasks in secondary research, collection of academic research articles, collection of examples, the tutorial exercises and the seminar exercises is to teach you and to train you how to engage with competitive intelligence gathering. So you want to be looking around the world. You want to be finding out what is there to know about the people we're taking on. What can we find out directly from websites, from searching with Google, from looking at complaints forums, from reading Yelp reviews. What is out there that's knowledge that we can use that we can then build on to make decisions. This is also why we're going to teach you market research in a couple of chapters. Other aspects you want to be thinking about is your market structure. What's the environment you're in? What are you up against? Now, monopoly can be seen as reasons not to enter a market or time to rub your hands together with glee because there's only one opponent. They're big, they're dominant. So there'll be disgruntled customers, and you can get in there and get up after them. Or you can look at the competition where there's a lot of people, you know, perfect competition. There's a lot of players in this game. Excellent time to come in and consolidate. What can we do to take out the people around us? There are, as with everything else, there's no good or bad market structure to view. There's only the decision that you make based on the market structure that exists. We're very zen like that in marketing sometimes, that there is really a case of the information is balanced. It's the decision that matters. You can look at any given information and also make a decision that you implement is better than a decision that you don't implement. Tech environment, this is one of the things that's kind of interesting is we simultaneously are responsible for creating it and it's one of these things we need to be aware of. From a marketer's perspective, from a marketing lecturer's perspective, the idea of a pre-recorded lecture with a whole series of interactive functions on it, 
Competitive advantage? Yes. I've got a class on a Friday afternoon. This is a competitive advantage, being able to provide you this material early in the week. So it's about the decision you make. Or I could have seen this as a competitive threat. So, well, all this high technology means people don't need to come into my lectures. That can be a competitive advantage or a competitive threat. Again, what's there, what's happening, and what can we do with it? Legal environment, there's a lot of stuff here. Again, we're just skimming over the top. Make friends with someone from law school or become that someone from law school people we need to befriend in order to understand what's happening out in the marketplace. But basically, there's a series of rules that bind us in terms of cheating. We can't lie in our advertising. We can't mislead our consumers, but nor do we want to. The legal environment's great because it provides us with the absolute hard penalty of don't go past that marker. But really, we want to be playing in the ethical environment where we're doing the right thing because doing the right thing's profitable. Sociocultural environment, we're going to talk a lot more about this when we get into consumer behavior. But there's a couple of facets about this we want to understand is this is the big, broad sweeping brush. This is where we start making stereotypes about groups of people based on the year they were born in. And I'm talking here about Generation Y, Generation Z, Generation X, baby boomers, assuming that everybody born in a 20 year or a 10 year or a five year gap are identical. It's a little rough and it's a little against the principle of segmentation, but demographics and sociocultural facets do give us some broad trends that we can use when we get into consumer behavior. All right, so we've talked about planning, planning processes, some of the research, some of the information we need to gather. I want to briefly mention the marketing plans. Again, you're not being asked to create a marketing plan this semester, so don't make a marketing plan. But I want you to understand that plans and the planning processes are very closely connected because the plan is the output. So let's talk about the marketing plan. In a marketing plan, your objectives are going to be very specifically tied. They can be tied to the brand, they can be tied to the product, and they can be tied to the customer. Sometimes you get multiple objectives to a plan, sometimes you have a single objective in a plan. If you want to go and address the creation of a new audience, so you've got a product and you want a new audience, it's going to be objectives based around customers. If you've got customers but you want to give them something more, your plan is going to be based around product features. If you want something that you want, if you've got a product, you've got a plan, got a product, you've got a customer, congratulations, product features and customers are going to be in this. And if you have neither, customer, and you're building a new product, guess what? All three. But your objectives here, the idea is that you want to be able to say, what do we want to do as a result of implementing this document? What happens next? What's the output that we want to expect? The beauty of marketing is that marketing is actually one giant case of experimental design. And when we get to market research, we'll talk you through the experimental design, but basically all of marketing is an experiment. We change the price in a sale with the assumption that as a result of changing the price, an outcome will occur, and that's the experimental design. We have a hypothesis. Take 10% off, sell 25% more units, test the theory, put the product on sale, we sold 15% more units, well, close but no. We didn't make the objective, and that's our experimental design. In terms of marketing plans and what you do, again, you're looking at this from the point of view of you select a target market. Now, we don't, haven't talked about target market selection, and we don't talk about target market selection until about chapter 7. So there's no way you'd better do this right now. And the other thing to understand is that we're laying down some background information here that you don't have to act on and you won't need to act on until later in semester. But we're putting this idea in your head so that as you're working through, you can see, oh, this is why this new piece of information is relevant. So you can start building the puzzle together. Inside your marketing plan, you're also going to look at your marketing mix strategies. 
Selecting a target market is critical because once you say who you want, you can say, okay, I want people who are 20 to 25 years of age who work on the south side of Canberra. There is no point setting up your stall in Belconnen when you're trying to get the lunch crowd from Woden. It's down to things as basic as that. Once you pick your market and you know where your market is, you know where to put your outlets. So you know what to do with your distribution. Once you know who it is that you're dealing with and what sort of income they have, you know what sort of price represents good value to that person. If you know what their needs and wants are, then you can design your product. But you can't do the marketing mix successfully until you've decided who you're going to address. So your segment has to drive your mix. You can have a basic product that you can try and tailor and tweak to fit a segment, but you need to know that segment. And we will really hammer you about target marketing and segmentation because that's what sets us apart from engineering, from mass production, from everything else. The marketer's gift is the ability to go, this is a group of people I want to address. This is how I'm going to address them. All right, the monitoring and control is the last aspect. This is an important facet that we're going to talk about over the semester. You need to be able to measure. And in market research, we'll talk about metrics, and we'll talk about metrics at a few other points. But basically, every plan starts with an objective. The metrics are the objective rewritten as a way of saying, did we achieve it? So if you say your objective is 5% growth, your metrics are going to have your sales figures in it, your current sales figures times 5% minus your actual sales figures at the end to find out whether you made your 5% growth or you didn't make it. And this is the thing is that marketing is actually scientific in the way that we observe, document and write down. And remember the difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. Thank you Mythbusters. The marketing plan, the monitoring and control section is to say what to ensure that you have undertaken what you have set out to do, that you have achieved the objectives you have set out to achieve, but also includes a checklist of the tasks you intended to undertake. So monitoring and control is both output and input. And we'll deal with this more over the course of the semester, but it's one of the tasks that it's worth taking this on board for your own life. If you set yourself to-do lists, and you set yourself a monitoring and control mechanism of, I want to achieve, I want to read a chapter a week, set yourself a time, set yourself a place, then set yourself a metric. Did I go to, I want to read a chapter a week, I want to do it in the library, I want to do it in the library at three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, check your calendar. Did you get to the library? Did you read the chapter? Tick it off? Yes, you did. Congratulations, your metrics have worked, they've tracked it. If you get to the end of the week and you look at the back and go, okay, none of these, I didn't meet any of these goals, you know you need to make some changes. But if you haven't had your metrics, and you haven't had your monitoring and control, you won't know. All right, this is a reminder that if you have any questions out of the content block here, is you can contact me over Twitter. You can go to Formspring to ask me a question if you want to stay anonymous. You can send me an email if you want something in a little more detail. If you need to come and see me, book in on the consultation times. They are made available by electronic booking so that everybody has a fair shot and that I don't double book, triple book or quadruple book for students to come and see me in a one 15 minute period. This is strategy. It is a subject that we are going to see recurring and it is a subject we have a full length course on. So don't worry if it feels a little overwhelming. It is the summary of the summary and the depth and details available for you if you want to study it in a future semester.